Hey podcast listeners, it's Marie Tupman here, and I'd like to welcome you to a brand new season of The Property Management Show. Now, as a business owner, you know that understanding what it takes to keep customers from leaving takes a lot of work. And putting things into place to actually keep them from leaving, well, that takes even more work. But how worthwhile is it for you to focus on retention, on churn, when there are a million other things you could be focusing on to grow your business? Well, that's what today's episode is about. Our guest is CEO of Profit Coach, Daniel Craig, and also he is one of the brains behind the NARPM accounting standards and the NARPM benchmarking studies. As a reminder, this podcast is brought to you by Four and Half Marketing Agency. We have been helping property managers with owner marketing since 2012, from strategy all the way to implementation. Visit fourandhalf.com to learn more. That's F O U R A N D H A L F.com. Thank you so much, Daniel, for making time on your busy schedule to be on the property management show today. Glad to be with you guys. Yeah. And today we are talking about churn and retention. Um, And, you know, in order for us to get into that, I wanted to kind of go back down memory lane a little bit. Now, in the first benchmarking study that you guys did, one of the biggest takeaways was that there's not a lot of profitability in a lot of property management companies. And that led to the creation of the NARPM accounting standards, which guys, if you haven't heard of it yet, like you better get on the train. Um, But no client retention and lifetime value are big factors that affect profitability. And so Daniel, can we start by you just talking to that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think there's a couple of things that play into that. Um, First of all, um, if you have uh, a low client retention, that means you have a leaky bucket. And when it comes to your sales and marketing efforts, uh, you're you know, investing a lot and in making sure those doors are coming in the front door. Uh, but if you don't have good retention and uh, customer experience as part of your overall organization, you just have those new doors going out the back door. And so what happens from a profitability perspective is that the money that you're spending on sales and marketing isn't really doing anything. It's just being spent. It's not really contributing any new value if the doors you're bringing on are just going right out the back. So I think that's a pretty significant way that lifetime value contributes to profitability because um, as you know, many organizations spend a lot of money on their sales efforts and their marketing efforts. And if those aren't actually producing new revenue uh, as a result of a growing company, uh, then you're just basically uh, a net loss on that sales and marketing effort. So that's why uh, one reason why the retention side of things is so important. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, when we look at uh, overall uh, profitability in an organization, the way that profit increases, this is really, 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 really basic, is by revenue increasing. And so um, if you don't have a decent lifetime value on the clients that you're bringing in the door if they're not staying with you, then it significantly impacts your rate of growth. And if your rate of growth is uh, significantly impacted, uh, you're losing significant opportunity uh, to cash in on the profit of those doors staying with you uh, long term. So, you know, very practically, uh, you lose money by having low retention if you're not getting any value out of your sales and marketing and if those doors aren't staying with you. Uh, over the long haul. So would you say that um, the effectiveness of the sales and marketing dollars a company spends is affected by whether or not you can hold on to them? Yeah, for sure. I mean, at the end of the day, the money that you spend, the result that you're trying to get from that is a good quality door in the door. Um, But if the good quality door in the door uh, is just another door leaving the back door, uh, or if that good quality door in the door turns into a bad experience and a bad referral, uh, then, you know, you're basically, you know, paying money to have create a negative experience that's going to create a a negative reputation and that's ultimately going to significantly impact the rate at which you can grow. You know, one of the things that I love to look at when new um, when, when people are trying to investigate, you know, the value that they're getting from their sales and marketing efforts uh, is their reputation. You say, well, why is that the case? Well, 
because um, if you're adding sales and marketing efforts onto a low reputation, then the effectiveness of those marketing dollars is significantly undermined. Uh, if you're spending those um, marketing dollars on top of a, a good reputation, then, then you're building on a foundation where you can actually just get a lot more juice out of the same mm-hmm. spend. And so it's really the foundation that you, the, the customer experience and reputation is really the foundation that you're building on when you're spending sales and marketing dollars. Um, I think the other thing that I would say there too is the, um, the, the big piece of growth that I, I don't think a lot of people necessarily think about when they're thinking sales and marketing strategy is organic referrals. It's certainly it's something that's talked about, but I don't know that people necessarily think about um, you know, organic referrals as a, a part of their marketing strategy. I mean, that's just something that happens on the side. And then my marketing strategy is pay per lead or different channels uh, for getting new leads and, and the referrals are what they are. But I, I think that that's a sort of a short-sighted way to think about your uh, sales and marketing holistically. You need to have a, re- a significant referral strategy um, as part of your sales and marketing efforts um, in terms of your overall conception, which one step back from that is your view of customer experience and how you're building an organization that uh, creates a certain experience and the proof that you're creating the kind of experience that you want to create is that people are talking about your business. Yeah, and that is something, Brittany, that you've talked a lot um, about in the past, right? The importance of reputation and that it, it shouldn't just be about how many stars you have online, but it should mirror the experience people have when they actually sign up with you. Do you have any other things you want to comment on, Brittany, about reputation? Um, yeah, I mean, I just completely agree with Daniel. It's like you can throw all of this money into marketing, but if you're not establishing yourself, not only online with the reviews, but within the community too, and making a name for yourself, your marketing dollars, I wouldn't say they'll, they'll go down the drain, but they're, they aren't going to, um, spread as wide for you. Right. And it, your leads become a lot more expensive and, the quality goes down a lot too, because you're, you're interacting from what I've seen, the people that are contacting you when your reputation is subpar, um, may not be the right clients as well. People that aren't really doing their research and really understanding what they're getting into. Yeah. 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 Agreed. And so I'm, I'm really curious to know, are you a glass half full or glass half empty kind of person, Daniel? Okay, when it comes to what specifically? <laughs> well, it comes to thinking about um, retention, right? So there are two sides to the same coin, basically. Yeah. If you're a company that focuses on tracking how many people we keep, it's kind of like a glass half full sure. um, versus let's focus on calculating how many people churn, which is glass sure. half empty. Sure. So, Cool. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, in terms of the actual metrics that we're watching with people, we are watching churn. Mm-hmm. Um, and, 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 but the, the net of that conversation or the direction of that conversation is uh, uh, looking at churn as a way of really diagnosing the chinks in your armor when it comes to your uh, customer experience. So in terms of the glass half full perspective here, I would say, um, that you certainly have to focus your team on what is the uh, customer experience that we're specifically trying to deliver at our organization. And then you can use churn as a way to get information and insight onto, into how you might be falling short of your ideal. Okay, so certainly in terms of the mantra to your team, it cannot be, hey guys, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Certainly the mantra needs to be, we have a very specifically defined customer experience at Profit Coach or at Four and a Half or, or you know ABC Property Management, and here is what that means, and here's how we deliver that in very specific ways. And then the churn can tell you and give you some really good feedback in terms of how well you are or are not delivering that. Um, and and I, I I recommend uh, certainly that you know organizations be collecting feedback from their customers outside of when they churn. Um, but perhaps some of the more honest feedback that you're going to get is, you know, when customers churn. So there's value to both. But here's what I would say. The takeaway certainly is something 
that you got to have, the, have to have a very clear vision of what you're seeking to lead your team toward. Um, and so one of the things that one of my business mentors has drilled into me is, you know, what is the profit coach experience? Um, and, you know, he's done a number of trainings with our team and he'll show up to those, those team trainings and ask various team members uh, at profit coach, what is your job? And some people will be like, you know, I do, um, you know, accounting and, uh, someone else will say, I do HR or someone else will say, you know, I'm a coach. Um, and one of the things that, uh, we have been working with our team to think about differently is the way they view their job and specifically their job is to deliver the profit coach experience. Um, and that, you know, certainly different people have different functions in the organization, but at a high level, uh, each team member's job is to deliver the profit coach experience, which is, you know, has a very specific definition. It's, you know, number one, uh, did I own the client's outcome? Did I fully solve their problem? Did I probe? Did I understand what they were trying to accomplish? Did I deliver a solution? Um, secondly, did I make it easy? Um, you, we can deliver a solution, but it'd be really painful. And that's not a great, a great customer experience. So did I deliver a solution? Did I make it easy? And at the end of that, um, did I do it in a way that really just provided an extraordinary service such that at the end of it, they say, wow. And the way that you know that you did provide something extraordinary is that they're going to go talk about it. Um, and so that's an example of a customer experience definition. That's the one that we use at Profit Coach. But the point is that for companies to be successful in customer experience, there needs to be boots on the ground clarity about what that looks like in my day in and day out job. And I can go and take that definition and I can sit down with one of my coaches and we can li listen to a call and I can say, did you solve the problem? Well, you know, you didn't even ask them any questions. How could you know what problem they were even trying to solve mm -hmm. if you didn't ask them any questions? That doesn't happen, but hypothetically speaking. Um, okay, did you make it easy? Well, you know, you transferred them to two different people. You know, how easy was that? Um, at the end of that, did they, did they say, wow, no, or, or on the flip side, maybe it's yes, yes, yes to all of those things. Hopefully it is. Um, and so the point is, um, when it comes to the glass half full, glass half empty, the vision has to be clear, a defined customer experience that everyone knows in a, in a, a tangible way, whether they are or are not delivering that if they're getting coached on that your team uh, gets enthused by delivering those great experiences. They're excited. Your clients get excited. People start talking. You get more referrals. Churn goes down. So ultimately, to your question, how do you attack churn? Focus on a customer experience definition and coach to it with your team. And it sounds like you do that. It's not, it's not retroactive, right? You don't wait until somebody churns to measure against that experience. You're doing right. it proactively coaching the team, yes. making sure that they're matching up with your company standards, whatever they may be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and to be honest, we do that at, you know, greater or lesser degrees at certain you know, points in time. But, um, you know, that, that is, that's the idea is that there is a, a, an ongoing conversation, uh, an ongoing coaching rhythm uh, where we're working with those things and uh, working through those, those points of the customer experience and helping them actually develop skills around how to develop those. Yeah. And it seems if you stay on top of that, then when a client does churn, you're not wondering, okay, did we not yeah. meet the standards? What, what else are we missing? What else do we need to bake into 100%. those things that we do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. 100%. And, and, and when you do have those experiences, uh, negative experiences, using those as opportunities to see, okay, was that just a one-off process people issue? Uh, or is there something more systemic that we need to look at and, and start coaching to as a team? So even the churn itself uh, is, is a good learning opportunity. And so to, to get more granular and specific with churn, I know that in the, um, the first benchmarking study the Profit Coach did, um, it found that the average annual unit churn rate is 25%, right? Mm -hmm. Now, metrics um, are not helpful if they exist in a vacuum. So you always yeah. have to think like, well, is that high? Is that low? Does, you know, is, can it be improved? Mm -hmm. um, and so I know that you guys are doing um, another benchmarking study and mm -hmm. the results will come out at NARPM national yeah. hashtag beat the benchmark. Um, and so 
you know, do you have any guesses, any like gut feel as to where that number is? Um, you know, is it same um, given that back when the first benchmarking study came out, people became aware of it, right? So yeah. you would think like, hey, I wonder what mine is, you know, yeah. and then hopefully they've been working towards it. And then fast forward 2022, it's better. But then on the flip side, the landscape is a lot more competitive. There's a lot more prop tech. So there's a lot more competition too. There are more property management companies that compete with you. So it's like, where do you think? It, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, good question. I, I, I would tend to say um, that th there's a couple of factors, the ones you mentioned, and also I think one of the biggest factors for churn uh, is, is, is certainly the sales market of the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I never really like it when people blame their churn issues on the market. Um, you know, I've never met a property management uh, entrepreneur that actually was losing units due to customer service. Like it's always the market, right? Um, uh, allegedly. Um, but but uh, that being said, I do think that there's no question, a lot of homes have sold uh, over the last couple of years. And so my anticipation, I, you know, I'm, I'm weeks, days away from seeing the data. We're just literally in the process of ingesting it all right now. Um, but my suspicion is that we're going to see a drop and then an uptick. Um, so, you know, it may be a drop in the 28, uh, uh, the 2019, 2018 period, then an uptick of churn in the 2020 and 2021 period. So that's, that's my, that's my get sense. We'll, we'll find out soon though. Yeah. What's interesting is um, I was really curious to know whether the 25% is an exorbitant number or is it yeah. you know, reasonable? Yeah, um, it, do you have any? Yeah, I do have an opinion on that. We generally say that anything under 15% is great. Um, there are definitely companies that are under 10%, um, but I, I generally say anything under 15% is great. Um, 15, you know, under 20 is okay. Um, and over 20 is not good. So uh, 25 is, 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 that's just, it's hard to grow mm -hmm. at 25% churn because what happens in, in terms of growth is that um, growth tends to be linear and churn tends to be you know, exponential or percentage-based. And so what happens is, um, you know, generally speaking, companies add anywhere from 10 to 30 doors per month, okay? People do more than that, but, but that's, that's a pretty safe range. You, you just don't find a lot of companies that add a lot more than 30 doors per month. Some of the most sophisticated, you know, marketing people that I see, you know, they're adding 30 to 40, okay? Um, unless we're, and I'm, I'm talking about single family doors. I'm not talking about, you know, portfolio acquisitions or multifamily, but once you hit a thousand doors, um, if you hit a thousand doors and you're at a 25% churn rate, um, that's 250 doors a year by that by 12. And you're looking at, you know, 20 doors out per month. And so, um, you know, it, that's just a lot to try to, you know, grow past. That's a lot of churn to try to kill battle. Um, definitely uphill battle. And, yeah. you know, because I'm a curious cat, I tried yeah. to look for information online, like, has anyone done any study as, you know, other than profit coach as to like churn rate, right? And then I thought to myself, like, hey, I wonder what's an average churn rate for mm -hmm. professional businesses, professional mm -hmm. service businesses, right? Mm -hmm. And it's around 16%, right? Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like similar to what you were describing. Mm -hmm. But I was like, yeah, but then maybe our listeners might argue, you know, property management is so unique. You can't like bucket it with just like generic professional businesses. So yeah. I went ahead and looked at Australia because Australia has a much deeper market penetration rate than the US. So I was thinking it's like aspirational, right? Whatever their um, average attrition rate is, mm -hmm. is an aspirational number for us. And I found that um, in 2020, according to the Real Estate Dynamics Rent Roll Growth Report, um, average rent road attrition annually is 17.3%, which confirms that um, gut feel that 25% was really high for our industry. And so there's a lot of work to do. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what, I think that there's certainly, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of property management entrepreneurs are, are thinking thoughtfully about churn and client experience. So I think, uh, I, I do think there's a lot of good things being done uh, by entrepreneurs in this space. 
And so what do you think about um, thinking of churn in terms of units versus owners? Like it may be different for different companies, but sure. like, um, you know, if you think about churn in terms of units, like you might end up in the slippery slope where you only really care about clients that have more doors, whereas they may not be the best fit for your business, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, I think there's a couple of things at play in that question. One is um, there is a version of churn that needs to happen in every company, and that's the, the segment of, the, of, of owners that are just not a good fit with your ideal client profile. And so um, I, I would just say like one of the things that we have noticed in consulting people from a profitability perspective as it relates to churn is one of the ways you can, you know, make more money is by firing owners. And that's kind of shocking. Like how would you make more money by firing owners? Well, some of these owners just, you know, take more than they contribute. And certainly you'd need to make labor adjustments at the same time. Uh, but the point is the doors, the doors themselves are, are, are a loss in terms of the revenue versus the time spent on them. And so definitely you got to suss out the owners that are not a good fit for your organization and, and, and you know, raise the prices to a point that it's worth it or get them off the bus. Um, but in terms of you know, measuring by units versus owners, I, I think just for practicality, um, it's easier to do it by units. Most companies in, in the space that we, uh, of companies that we work with are primarily single family. And so I, 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 you know, there's definitely onesie twosies in terms of an owner has, you know, two or three doors, but there's a lot of one-to-one. -one. Um, and so overall, I, I think it's, it's easier to, to measure it by units uh, because that does give you the clearest line of sight in terms of how your actual revenue generating portfolio size is impacted. So um, that, that's, that's my take on that. Right, and that might even indicate um, kind of like making sure that your portfolio is a little bit more diverse because maybe one year you do lose one client that has 200 properties yeah. and you take a really big hit. So that might be skewed that year. I mean, I've worked with clients who have had that experience or they had to lay off people because they lost a really big portfolio for right. whatever reason. And they had to rethink their mindset about their ideal clientele, right? It's like, maybe I don't want to work with one person that owns 200 properties because right. if they end up leaving us, um, it becomes more of an issue. Or maybe if I do, I need to supplement that with more one-to-one -one, mm -hmm. um, people mm -hmm. to kind of make it different. So it is interesting yeah. to think about it that way. Yeah. And I think so too, understanding who your ideal client is, Brittany, I know you always talk about this, but if you are in the business of wanting to serve owners with large portfolios, then you better make sure the service and the experience that you deliver is a perfect fit to what that kind of owner is looking for. Yeah. Because what they're looking for is not the same as what, uh, you know, a, a small time investor with just like two duplexes is looking mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a great point. And, you know, I think one of the nice things about the single family space is, that generally you you are a little bit more insulated to massive swings in income uh, as a result right. to a smaller um, you know portfolio size. There certainly a, is a pain point around that. There's more owners to deal with, but I would just say that in many cases when you have larger clients and their single family, it's still a single family house. So in terms of the effort to manage, it's re relatively the same. Uh, outside of, you know, the work related to maybe a more streamlined owner relationship because it's one to, you know, 50 or, or, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But the, the problem when, with those large portfolios is I just find many cases that those people, those owners end up giving, getting a lot of leverage on the management company and can tend to just be less profitable relationships. Not always, um, but you just have to ask the question at the end of the day, is the efficiency that we get out of, um, having one owner with a bunch of units, uh, how does that compare to the level of uh, lost opportunity by virtue of kind of getting prices negotiated down? Right. Almost like a give and take kind of thing where it's like, we're giving them this, are we getting back the yeah. um, concessions or whatever it is we want to call it that. Exactly. That 
yeah, yeah. that make up that type of relationship. And, and to what extent does that actually reduce our cost to manage? Right. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I think that's an important thing is some people look at, you know, I'm going to discount significantly uh, for, um, you know, a, a, an owner with multiple doors. And the thought is, well, you know, they've got multiple doors. It's going to be a quick bump uh, in revenue. And that's true. But on the day to day, is the actual effort associated with that really that streamlined because you've got three individual doors with one owner as opposed to three doors with three. Where owners. are the doors? Are they, are they um, yeah, exactly. all in one neighborhood? Are they in different cities? Yeah, lots of different factors to consider. Yeah. I do have one uh, more question. And so um, given that you coach people in profitability, you look at their books, um, and you're also big on like customer experience and doing everything you can to prevent the churn, right? To begin yeah. with, where should the budget for like retention, even like you know, a profit coach, you have this person coming in training the your 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 team members on how to deliver a better customer experience. Where does that fit in someone's budget? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, uh, there's certainly uh, a line item in, in the way that we look at financials for consultants. Um, but I generally tend to think that that's something that's done more internally uh, and that supervisors are the ones that need to take responsibility for having that ongoing conversation uh, with, with uh, their reports. So one of the things that we uh, are big on here at Profit Coach is uh, working with mid-level managers at property management companies to architect the way work gets done. And that certainly refers to um, not only the efficiency side of things, but also the way that customer experience is delivered as well. And so what I would say is you need to work with your mid-level managers to make sure that they're really clear on what the customer experience is and then have them equipped and tasked with coaching everybody in their team to deliver that customer experience. And so I think that's the best way to go about it from an economy perspective would be um, to just make that part of the warp and the woof of your organization, certainly bring outside input as you need for a shot in the arm, but it's really got to be integrated into the mid-level management so that it's pushed down at all levels. Where those mid-level managers fall in the chart of accounts, typically they're still uh, direct labor. Great. I will have one last question Yeah. Um, because four and a half is in property management marketing. Yes. Um, you know, one of the data points from the first benchmarking study that caught my attention was that the ROI on sales and marketing spend is all over the place. Yes. It's, it's not like an intelligible, like, oh, this linear relationship. And so what do you think is contributing or the biggest contributor mm-hmm. to that? Sure. You know, I'm glad you asked. I actually have an opinion on this. Oh. Um, and I think it really comes down to the mindset of the owner. Um, and here's what I mean. Um, do you as an owner view marketing and sales as sort of this thing that you have to do? It's not really central to what you're all about. You're all about property management, but you know that in order to grow and in, in order to achieve your, your dreams, you gotta, you gotta do some amount of sales and marketing to get the doors in the door. If, if that's the way you think about it, then you're likely to take shortcuts because you haven't really embraced a better vision for your company, which is, I think, where you think of sales and marketing as you know, perhaps more central to the, to the essence of your organization than even property management. One of the things that, again, the same mentor would ask me, uh, is do you run an accounting company that happens to do sales and marketing or do you run a, a sales and marketing company that happens to do accounting? And I would ask the same thing of the people listening. Do you run a sales and marketing organization that happens to do property management or the other way around? And that will tell us a lot about you, your mindset around sales and marketing. Um, and so the, what, what the, the result of that is do you embrace the function of being the sales and marketing strategist for your company. Um, this might be controversial, mm-hmm. but I, I really don't think that um, you, you can certainly delegate the implementation and the how and certainly work with partners on strategy, but you cannot check out of ultimately 
being the one who owns the sales and marketing strategy for your organization. And, and so, and because if you do, then what's going to happen is you're going to take shortcuts and shortcuts are expensive. And so back to your original question, um, the, what, what I think we saw was people sort of being like, I want to grow. And so it's, you know, well, I've got cash and I'm just going to spend it. And without a clear strategy that they're owning, they're not monitoring the spend and they're not holding the spend accountable to getting the kind of results that they need to get if they want to, um, uh, you know, get a good return on investment for that spend. And all of that to me stems back to whether or not you as the owner are embracing the responsibility of being the ultimate owner of strategy. Again, not to say that you can't get partners around strategy, uh, not to say that you can't, you know, delegate the implementation, but you have to, you have to have to have input. Yeah. I I really um, am amazed that, you know, from your point of view, that is true because certainly for four and a half, we actually encounter difficulties when clients just want to you know, throw money at like a channel and say like, I just want to throw money at like, you know, Mm -hmm. Google ads. And then I just want leads. Mm -hmm. And we're like, Hey, can we schedule a call? We want to understand who your ideal client is because that's our process. Like, we're not just going to like take your budget and like go with it. Like we have to understand who's a perfect fit for your company. Like what kinds of tools do we need to attract those kinds of people and educate them before they call you? And, you know, the, um, the the interesting thing is, like you were saying, like you can get partners on the strategy, like someone to bounce ideas off of, ask you the questions to solidify it. Sure. You don't have to be a market. I think that's the thing. You don't have to be a marketing expert. Like, a, yes, mm-hmm. you're an expert in property management. You're running a company. You don't have to be an expert in marketing, but you do need some input. And if you're not an expert in marketing, like work with someone who can ask you the right questions and then you don't have to implement it either. But like, you can't just check out and throw money at something. Right. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, to build on that, the other piece of this too, is also the um, kind of long-term versus short-term game mm-hmm. that you're playing. Um, short-term strategies tend to be expensive. Long-term strategies tend to be more, ec- more economical. Um, I think, you know, the easy comparison there is paper lead uh, versus content, right? Um, content is a long-term strategy but it works. Um, referrals are a long-term strategy, but they work and it's, it's ultimately affordable. Um, so uh, I, I would say get the right mindset and take a long-term perspective and you're going to make the best use of, of your marketing budget. Yeah. And if people are skeptical about content and you're listening to this, that this is content. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And so great. I'm really excited about the upcoming um, benchmarking study um, for our listeners who are going to NARPM National. We will see you there. Daniel, you want to tell them about Beat the Benchmark? Yes. Yes. So we are releasing the benchmark study um, that NARPM has commissioned us to do, uh, the 2022 NARPM Financial Benchmark Study at NARPM National. And um, we want to have some fun with this. Um, you know, anybody like playing games around here? Well, we want to play a game called Beat the Benchmark. And um, the idea is that uh, the conference runs Monday through Thursday. Thursday, the last day of the event, we're going to do the formal unveiling of the uh, new benchmarks. But up till then, we're going to gamify the vendor hall experience at NARPM National. And there's going to be about a dozen different vendors that are going to have uh, basically wager boards where you can guess what the new benchmark is on 12 different metrics, whether that's profit per unit or revenue per unit or profitability. And if you are the winner of that particular category, then you're going to get an awesome price. Uh, And so that's how the game works in essence. And you can guess multiple times. If you want to get more guesses, you can donate to Narpin's charity, make a wish and get more guessing opportunities, buy more wager chips and make more guesses. And the winner, the grand prize winner will get a uh, $3,000 cash prize. So it should be fun. Should be fun indeed. Well, we hope to see you all at NARPM National. Thank you so much, Daniel, for making time for the podcast. Absolutely. Good to be with you all today. Thank you for uh, the opportunity. Hey, remember earlier when we were talking to Daniel about spending your marketing dollars wisely and finding a partner for your marketing strategy and implementation? Well, that's what four and a half does in a nutshell. 
We are a marketing agency that's been helping property managers with owner marketing since 2012, from strategy all the way to implementation. You can visit our website, fourandhalf.com, to learn more. That's F-O-U-R-A-N-D-H-A-L-F.com. By the way, if you have any feedback, questions, or suggestions for our podcast, you can send an email to marketing at fourandhalf.com. We would love to hear from you. Also, if you're enjoying our show, please consider leaving a rating or review on the listening app of your choice. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time where we'll talk about factors that affect owner churn. See you then.